Let's start at uh, Jeremiah. But my main scripture is going to be uh, John 10.10. 10. So give me John 10.10 10 first and we'll bounce back to John 10. And I think you've all heard of this verse, all right? A thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness until you overflow. So the promise that Jesus has made when he came to the earth is that I've come to give my people an abundant life. Not a life of abundant after this life and when you go to heaven, but abundant life now. And so the question that we need to ask is, why is it that most lives of Christians, we can have a, 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 an abundant wealth because in America, you're actually rich, okay? Compared to the other countries, you are, you are living abundantly. And so, therefore, your abundance is measured and compared with other billionaires that are in the Western world. But if you compare your life with people in the third world countries who live very in, 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 in severe poverty, they will say you, you are living an abundant life, Right? So that can be relative in terms of, you know, what, what we think is abundant and what we think is not because we compare it based on other people's situation. But regardless, it's not just about wealth, right? Not about physical money or wealth. Although that does help, yes, but abundant life as in uh, your life in, in, within your heart, is it whole? Are you satisfied? Are you one, a, a Christian who is, say, who is basically consistently living, thank you, God, for my life. Thank you that I was born. And you come to realize how good he is of all that you have received and the salvation you have received compared to 9 billion people on this earth. Or are you still at the stage of my life sucks? Why was I born? Right? Why are you struggling? Why are you lacking? Always fighting, always complaining. You can be in that, that camp, if you will, right? The very few people on the abundant life camp where, they're, where they're, you're really satisfied. You're satisfied with your marriage. Your, your relationship with your wife or husband is good. You know, it's good. It's like... This is, the, this is the marriage you dreamt about. In fact, it's more than what you dreamt about because God has a lot more for us. There's no problem with money. There's no problem with your health, your children, your spiritual life, right? There's no lack. You're satisfied. Drugs don't tempt you. Drinking don't tempt you. Smoking, weed, whatever, right? Other, other, you know, promiscuous, opposite sex. You don't need to look in your phone at the other pictures of other, you know, people to get you all excited. When you got a wife or a husband, you're satisfied. You're good. No, I'm not saying, you know, you're, I'm not saying that you have certain thoughts. Because we all have certain thoughts, Okay. The enemy, the demons still put thoughts in your mind to make you look, to make you think. And you got, and you got to stop. It's like a friend, you know, giving you some drugs or, or, or whatever and say, here, take some. You don't have to take it, okay? It's, it's always going to be there. You go to Costco. I go to Costco and then you go to one hour, it's all liquor, wines, right? That's what I used to do a lot before, you know. I was like, ooh, Remy Martin. But it doesn't faze me anymore. And I used to smoke cigarettes for addicted for 20 years. Now I hate it. I don't, you know, it's 10 bucks a pack now, right? It's crazy. But I hate it now. I hate the smell. But before, it's like, you know, I got, I got to go buy it. 
I don't need it anymore. You see? It's, this is the fullness God wants. I'll bring up the uh, definition. This word abundant in the Greek is persion, meaning exceedingly, very highly, beyond measure, more superfluous. That means like um, more than enough, okay? It's more than enough, more than you need. A quantity so abundant as to be considerably more than what one would expect or anticipate. So God wants to give us a life that is overflowing and more than you need, okay? It's like people on EBT, they buy so much groceries, it's just getting rotten. Not funny? Because that's what happens sometimes. You got this money, you got to spend it, so you buy all this grocery and, and you buy some good food, and it goes bad because you can't eat it all, right? But that's, that's God's way. He wants to just give you so much it's not a waste. In fact, it's just, it's just you just have too much. And, and through that, you want to just, it's not like, oh, this is a waste. Through that, God wants to show you, like, you give you the revelation. Wow. And God is overflowing. Not just food, of course, right? I'm talking about what's more important, your peace, righteousness, rest in God, Everything that just, just, you know, your calmness is good. Even if the world is falling apart, because there's a lot, lot of violence and, and, and crime these days too. War, natural catastrophe, whatever is happening in the world, you're not affected. It's like, you know, I'm good. If God takes me, he takes me. Because you, you're like confident, you know where you're going. You're not swayed by inflation or, or war or natural disasters because there's a lot of talk constantly. In, the, in this country, you got talk about the, the national debt, the national debt ceiling. You got, you know, the, you know, you got the parties, political parties. You got to talk about civil war, all kinds of nonsense. You got the, the, the addictions of fentanyl drug users, right, in, on our streets. Climate issues, if, if it's, whether it's free or not, doesn't matter, right? That doesn't affect you. You got God. God's going to take care of this. And your focus is on God, not on the, on the issues of the world. Okay? All right. So, God wants to give you this life where your relationship with him is so good, right? You're just like, you know, like, I don't know if you guys were ever in love, right? You're in love, like, oh, he loves me, not he loves me. Something like that. Hmm? You're just like so in love with God. The other stuff out there doesn't, it doesn't bother you. It's not your business. I'm not saying they're not important, but you found your true beloved love. Okay? That's where you need to get to. All right? Amen? All right. Let's go to Jeremiah. Now, I want to contrast something. God's people, when Jesus came, and modern day God's people today, I'm going to contrast some similarities and some, con and some difference, okay? So, God's people, we have this pattern, all right? If you read the Bible, there's this pattern. And this pattern is like, doesn't go away. It's like most of modern day Christians, we have this problem. What is this problem? This problem is that, you know, instead of living that abundant life, you're more in survival mode, help me mode. I need deliverance mode. I am in, I'm in poverty mode. I am sick. I am sick. I need help. So we're in constant I need help mode when we are actually the sons and daughters of God. And you're supposed to be the ones, you know, the helpers. And, the, and people are supposed to come to us. The worldly governments are supposed to come to us. Right? Nebuchadnezzar to Daniel. You, you are serving the real God. 
Anybody who talks bad about his God is dead. Why? Because Daniel, see, for Daniel to get to that place, he had to go through some stuff, right? Can you go through some, can you be thrown in a den of lions and see if you survive? We should try that. See if you got some faith, huh? You can be cat food, or you can become number three man. All right. This is Jeremiah. This is a pattern, okay? Whether we're reading Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, there's a pattern, and you have to know there's a pattern in you also, okay? Uh, Jeremiah 7, 3 to 8. This is what the Lord of Heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. Even now, if you quit your evil ways, I will let you stay in your own land. We are uprooted from the life of peace or stability, and we are placed in a life of desperation. It's not because the devil is doing it, although he is used, it's because of the root issue of your sin. Sin or evil ways. We can look at it that way. But don't be fooled by those who promise you safety simply because the Lord's temple is here. They chant, the Lord's temple is here. The Lord's temple is here. So in the modern time, or uh, in those times, because uh, God's temple was there, and God's presence would be there because of the ark, they just presume they're safe. Okay? And so when Jesus came, they were like, we are Abraham's, ch- uh, we are Abraham's children. We're good. We're safe. What would modern-day Christians say? They don't say, oh, the church is here in Fremont. They don't say that. They said, we are saved. That's their chant. We are saved. You know, whether they're doing bad things or good things, we are saved. We're going to heaven. That's just your natural reaction reflex. We're going to heaven. You, have, you don't even really know that. You just, you're believing it, yes, which is a good thing, and you're hoping. But do you really, really know deep in your spirit you're, you're really good with God, or is it more like, oh, yeah, I hope so. Eight, but I will be merciful only if you stop your evil thoughts and deeds and start treating each other with justice. Only if you stop exploiting foreigners, orphans, and widows. Only if you stop your murdering and only if you stop harming yourselves by worshiping idols. Then I will let you stay in this land that I gave to your ancestors to keep, keep forever. Don't be fooled into thinking that you will never suffer because the temple is here. It's a lie. Don't be fooled just because you are saved and you go to church that you will not suffer. You can look at it that way. Why do Christians suffer? Why do they suffer? Why did God's people suffer in the Old Testament? Why do people suffer today? Why did Jesus suffer? To learn obedience. You see, God uses pain. Okay, God's going to use pain to make you change direction. You keep going that way, more pain. You like pain? Some people like pain, I guess. Right? Right? They just want more pain. But if you don't like pain, then you better change directions. So God uses suffering to teach us obedience. All right? The quicker you obey, the more you obey, the less you suffer. And sometimes we suffer because of our bad choices. Not to learn obedience, but we just make bad choices in life. Right? If you go rob a store, you're going to end up in jail. So you're suffering in prison. That's not suffering for God. You suffer because you made a dumb choice trying to rob a liquor store or whatever. Just hypothetically, not saying you're done. Maybe. Some of you could look like criminals. Okay, let's go back to John 10 now. So, think about this, okay? When Jesus came, and before he came, there's no printing press. All right? The people of God cannot just find a book on Amazon and start reading the Torah. So they're handicapped in many ways. They have to have the synagogue 
or the temple where the priests are to read the scriptures to them. They're dependent on the priests to not only read, but to interpret and teach the people. And so it's the people's job to actually go to the synagogue or the temple and to go learn, right? So it's kind of like the same setup here. Now, like I said, they don't have the ability to, a lot of them don't even have the ability to, to probably read and write. Because, you know, that's a new thing too. Right, so a lot of people in today's time, you just because you know how to read and write, think everybody knew how to read and write. No, this is a new modern day thing. All right, two hundred years ago, most people don't know how to read or write. There's no free educational system at that time. They just based on the word they hear. That's why the Bible says your faith based on what you hear, right? Because in those times, that's all they can do, just hear. Today, your hearing is defined by you having the ability and your choice to read the books. Now, what's the common denominator of God's people when Jesus came and God's people today? The difference is that today, they all know how to read. Right? That's the difference. They don't know how to read. You know how to read. What's the common thing? They don't, know, they don't know the Bible because they can't read it. And today, you know how to read, but you don't read the Bible and you don't know the Bible. Right? Maybe not more in my church, but out there. A lot of Christians out there, you have the Bible. They know how to read, but they don't read the Bible. And they don't know the Bible. So they're in the same situation as when Jesus came. They don't know the Word. And some people just read the, the daily devotionals. That's not reading the Bible. You read one daily devotional doesn't mean you read the Bible. You don't even understand the context. You just, and most times when they put these, you know, devotional out, they always put good scripture, right? Happy scripture. They don't put the other half of God's wrath and judgment and, and, and other serious things. And so if you don't know the word of God, and you don't know, pray, how are you going to get to the abundant life? You're going to go buy a lottery ticket? Yesterday I said, you know, my father-in-law is here. Some people buy lottery tickets, right? <laughs> now, some people, like this is, this is what a lot of Christians do. And I think their intent is good, okay? They say, I want to buy a lottery ticket, and if I win the billion dollars, they're going to help build God's church. And, you know, I was thinking about that. And, you know, the thought that came to me was this. What would God, how would God respond? You know what he'll say? Okay, he'll say, all right, you want me to let you win the lottery so you can use someone else's money to give to me. What about your money? You don't want to give your money, but you want to get somebody else's money to give to me. He's not going to let you win the lottery then. It's like more like, okay, what about your money? Give that to as an offering of yourself. That would really mean something to God because it, it, it costs you something. It costs you something. Right? So many Christians, you know, they do silly things. All right. Let's go, um, go, let's go to um, verse 1. <laughs> All right, so modern-day Christians, a lot of them have not read the Bible, just like the Old Testament saints. Now, they can't read the Bible because there's not, like, abundant Bibles everywhere. They don't have the Bible app, and some of them don't, a lot of them don't even know how to read or even know how to do mathematics, okay? They're just farm peasant people. So their type of grace is going to be a lot different than modern-day Christians. Your grace is not going to be the same as theirs. Because today, you have the ability to write and do math. You got Bibles in your phone, Bibles everywhere coming out of your ears. And most of us, 
you'll go after you'll go study something else more passionately than studying the word of God because that should be your first passion. If you don't know the word of God, you're you're a handicapped Christian. And and you're going to want want to know why this is happening to my life. Why is my life suck? Why is this? Why that? And and it's like you, you know you, it's like you who don't know how to, you don't know your alphabet, you don't know your math, and so you're trying to function in society, and the only job you're going to get is, is flipping burgers, even when you're 50 years old, because you don't, have, you don't know how to run a register, you don't know how to read or write. Spiritually, it's the same thing. If you're not spiritually educated by knowing the word, you're going to flip spiritual hamburgers. You, you can't, how are you going to be a one of authority? How are you going to lead God's people? How are you going to go to the nations? You can't, okay? You, you, it, anything you do, whether in real life, whether you pursue a career and you become good at something, you have to become a professional Christian too. And that's your first order in life. You have to become a professional Christian first before you become a professional something out there. Because being a professional Christian will bring you the abundant life as you go take the land out there. But if you try to take land out there in the world and, you're, and you're, you're, you don't have the tools, you, you know, we can say, I have the armor of God. You have no idea what that means. You just say it. I have the armor of God. <laughs> Ouch. And then you go get defeated. Right? What does that mean, armor of God? All right. Let me start here. This is in John 10. Jesus is talking about the abundant life, but he gives the Pharisees a parable. Jesus said to the Pharisees, listen to this eternal truth. The person who sneaks over the wall to enter into the sheep pen rather than coming through the gate reveals himself as a thief coming to steal. All right, hold on. The sheep pen, for our purposes of learning, consider it your church, okay? This is where the sheep is. And I put an article, sheep are not dumb, as most churches teach us, okay? Sheep are very smart. I think, like I said on the, on the, on the band, that in the past, a lot of Pastors and churches say sheep are dumb because, you know, they deal with a lot of rebellious, disobedient people. But they're very cunning. And, and you know, I put the article, right, the uh, University of Cambridge in the U.K., fifth most pre prestigious college in the world, did a study on sheep. Why, I don't know. For us, I guess. So they have a sheep looking at pictures. Okay. Face, two faces, and the sheep recognizes the face. They, they conclude the sheep is smart as a monkey or a pig. And you know, you heard dogs and pigs are kind of smart. So sheep are, you're, so you're actually very smart if you're supposed to be a sheep, okay? So you can't play that, I'm, I don't know nothing anymore. You've been exposed. So you're all smart, okay? Now, the sheep pen or the church, or your family. So your family, your household, is your own sheep pen, okay? And then there's this person who tries to sneak over the sheep pen to come kill, destroy, and slaughter, right? And so that can represent as the demons trying to come over into your family, all right, and to bring chaos and disorder. Verse 2, but the shepherd walks right up to the gate, and because the gatekeeper who know who he is, he opens the gate to him. Okay, stop. The true shepherd is Jesus, and there's a gatekeeper. And I've told you before that in this church, my wife and I, as your senior pastors, we are the gatekeepers to this church. That means that <clears throat> it's going to go, uh, it's going to discuss this more in the, in the scripture. There's a gate, Right? In Jerusalem, there was the wall. So in this church, we have the church. We have doors. All right? So we're the gatekeepers. 
It doesn't mean that we're like checking people as they're coming through the door, but the, 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 the voices, even through our message, the voices, the dreams, the visions, your behavior needs to be discerned as it tries to come into the sheep pen. If we're talking about your families, the head of the household or the spiritual head of the household in your family, you, you are the gatekeeper to your house. You, you have to police what comes into your house based on what your children watch, what they hear, what your spouse hears, what your spouse does, all of that, right? You're the gatekeeper because if you let anything come in the house, whether it's physical people, bad friends, strangers, or, or messages through the internet, messages through the TV, that's going to bring a, a spirit of influence into your children or your spouse or your family. And if you don't get a hold on this, well, that, that spirit is going to come over the wall and kill, steal, and destroy your family. This is how it works, okay? Now, I'm not saying that you turn off your electricity and you can't watch no TV and listen to nothing. This is based on your faith, and this is based on, and you, you got, it's constant policing, okay? You can watch certain movies, yes. I'm not saying you can't go to the movies. But if it's controlling you, well, that's the problem, right? Okay? Music is a little different than movies because the movies you just watch one time and you're kind of done with it. Music is more dangerous because your kids are just constantly listening to the same music, right? Same music. And if you're listening to a secular music with some negative lyrics, constantly listening, constantly listening, constantly listening, it's wiring your brain. And when it's wiring your brain, it's putting that spirit into you. To, to mold your thought process. All right. So there's gatekeepers. And you will decide, or we decide in this church, if you bring a word to us, you bring a dream to us, you bring a vision to us, we're going to discern whether that word is for us from God or not. And the sheep recognizes the voice of the true shepherd, for he calls his own by name and leads them out, for they belong to him. And when he has brought out all his sheep, he walks ahead of them, and they will follow him, for they are familiar with his voice. So you have to be familiar with his voice. Now, everybody is going to just say, I'm familiar, right? First level is you got to know the familiar of his voice through the word of God. If you don't know the word of God or have not read the whole Bible to know what's in there, you're not going to know the voice of God. And I'm not saying even if you read the whole Bible that you're going to know, but at least you're going to move in the direction of being familiar to God's voice. But they will, verse 5, but they will run away from strangers and never follow them because they know it's the voice of a stranger. Verse 6, Jesus told the Pharisees this parable even though they didn't understand the word. So, let's go to seven. So, Jesus went over it again. I speak to you eternal truth. I am the gate for the flock. All right. Jesus is the shepherd, and now he's the gate. The gate is the fence. Think it over that way. He's the whole fence. Okay? He's the shepherd, the gate. All those who broke in before me are thieves who came to steal, but the sheep never listened to them. Nine, I am the gateway. The gateway is now the door, okay? So Jesus is saying, I am the fence, I am the door, and I am the shepherd. But he's not the gatekeeper, okay? The gatekeeper lets him in, which is, if, like I said, if we're the church, Letting him in is his authority, is his voice, is his ways. You're letting him in your house, 
or we're letting him in in this church. So the gatekeeper needs to know if this is really the shepherd to let him in. And if you're not on guard, the thief will come over the fence to cause problems, right? I am the gateway to enter through me. Okay, so listen to this. To enter through me, you got to go in the right gateway. You got to go in the right fence. Because if you do, you're going to experience this. You're going to, to enter through me is to experience life. So you're, you know, we're like, I'm saved. I, I got life, right? We, freedom and satisfaction. Now, we may say it. A lot of Christians out there, I'm saved. I'm free. I'm satisfied. Because I had a snicker bar. Are they really satisfied? No. Most Christians are not. Are they really free? No, they're not. Most are still living in poverty, spiritual poverty. Most are still captured by demonic bondage. Are they satisfied? No. They have a lack. They got problems with their marriages. They got problems with their children. They got problems with their career. They got problems with their, their you know, uh, uh, manhood or womanhood, midlife crisis. You might have lived a long life and you're just like surviving. You're just surviving. And every so often these foxes, as the Bible says, they come and start nibbling on your harvest or your farm, which is your life, and they cause troubles. And you're like, why don't these foxes can't get rid of them? Can't get rid of these demons that, and curses that constantly inter and interfere with your life so what do we do we you know we go to church now i'm talking in a generic broader sense okay not just my church but out there or they go to church sometimes they read the bible sometimes they pray sometimes when they're desperate or when they're in a need and then when things get better we don't stay the path of consistency and growing in God when, we get, when life gets better or God answers some of your problems, we go back to the old life. And that's what the Bible says. We keep going back to the idols. We keep going back to, to what we want, not what God wants. And so then we go back to the old life. You know, in the book of Judges, after Joshua died, so when Joshua's around, their people are, because they're under Joshua's government, so they're doing okay. But once Joshua dies, now they're like, party time! It's like, teacher's gone out of class. And so they start sinning and going back to their idols, and then God, okay, the Bible says, God sends the enemy to them to rob them God sends the enemy to rob his people and so not only rob them but oppress them take over so it's like today's day it would be like demons got demons are oppressing your life right they got a hold on your in a grip on your life so when they're when they're starving cuz the enemy has come and took all their harvest now they're like, oh, help me, God. You know, this is a familiar scene of all Christians, right? Help me, God. So what does God do? He raises up a judge, a leader, okay, to teach people what to do. Tell them how to get back to God. And so in the first couple chapters of Judges, when they did this, God sent the enemy of another nation to oppress them for eight years. And then when God raised up the judge and gave them freedom, they had peace for 20 years. And having peace for 20 years, they got into the same problem. And then God sent the enemy again to spank them. 
And this time, instead of eight years of oppression, they got 16 years of oppression. Double up. And then when they cried out and God sent them a judge, they got 40 years of peace. You see this pattern? You keep making the same mistake and it's just going to be a longer, you know, time of restoration, longer time of, of, of many things. Okay? And so, okay, that's fine. Let's go back to uh, uh, um, John. So if, if you are entering through the right fence, gateway, and listening to the right voice, not, I'm not saying mixed voice, because a lot of Christians might, you might be able to get, uh, you might be able to hear God, okay? We're not against that, but if you haven't read the Bible, you shouldn't even try to be hearing God, except through the Word first. If you, if you got a lot of carnal problems, and you're fleshly, and you're all over the place, you should be very careful trying to hear God because you're getting a lot of signals, okay? God, there's only one voice of God, and there's millions of other voices coming at you, which is the demons. How are you going to discern this is God? And if you can't discern, you should not be trying to hear God because most people try to hear God out of pride. And, now, and then you look at your life, okay? Where has it gotten you by trying to hear God? Are you at the green pastures and living the abundant, satisfied life because you were able to hear God's voice? Or are you in a place of curse and chaos because you listen to the wrong voice? Now, sometimes you might have the ability to hear God, yes. Because sometimes God will talk to us because He needs to. But then you're also getting a mix. Other voices coming your way. And the minute you listen to the wrong voice, you are now a false prophet. And if you walk around as a false prophet, your life is cursed. And you're going to experience cursed things. Verse 10. A thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy. If you're experiencing that, that means a thief is in your realm, and you let him in. Okay, you let him in they, by going over the fence. But I've come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect. Life in its fullness until you overflow. You're satisfied. You're not thirsty. You're not hungry because you're full and filled inward and outward of the Holy Spirit. Your marriage is like improving, becoming the ideal marriage restoration. Your children, right, they're being blessed. God is blessing them, and they're being raised up to be those godly children. You know, your workplace, your job, your money, everything is expanding. And not only expanding, but you have a fullness in you. You're like, oh, I'm satisfied. It's like eating a really good meal. Woo, that was so good. Instead of eating a meal and go, I'm still hungry. I'm unsatisfied. I need to go find me a donut. And that's what, that's what a donut is. It's an idol. Okay, metaphorically speaking. You eat and you're unsatisfied. Right? You're like searching for something. I need something. I need something to help me. Feel. That's what people do. I am the good shepherd who lays down my life as a sacrifice for the sheep. 12, 13. But the worker who serves... But the worker who serves only for wages is not a real shepherd because he has no heart for the sheep. He will run away and abandon them when he sees the wolf coming. The wolf is the devil, all right? The hireling of the shepherd is the wrong voice that you listen to. And you become that hireling because it's about you now. It's about your greed, you, what you want. And you're not laying down the life for God's people, but you're just more worried about your own life. And, the, and then the wolf mauls the sheep, drags them off, and scatters them. I alone am the good shepherd, and I know whose hearts are mine. For they recognize me and know me. 
Just as my father knows my heart and I know my father's heart, I am ready to give up my life for the sheep. Okay. I want to read a few more. And I have other sheep that I will gather which are not of this Jewish flock. And I, their shepherd, must lead them too, and they will follow me and listen to my voice. And I will join them all into one flock with one shepherd. The point of this message of abundant life, okay, to receive abundant life is to have the true shepherd enter the gateway. To have the true word of God enter your life. And when the true shepherd or the word, the pure word of God enters your life, you will experience satisfaction. You will experience abundance. You will experience abundant life. We may think, well, I got, I got the truth, don't I? In some measure, many Christians out there do have the truth, as in like, you know, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He went to the cross, died on the cross, resurrected. So they have that measure of truth, yes. And that's all elementary basic to get someone into the kingdom. The Bible says that you got to enter through the narrow way. For broad, okay, the wider the road, the broad leads to destruction. But the word also says the narrow way has a narrow door. The broad way has a broad door, a big door, swinging door. The narrow door can represent a church or a family. It's like our, let's say our church. Our church has a lot more different ways than other churches out there, right? We have longer services. That means our door is more narrow. You want a, you want a one hour church? That door is pretty swing wide. A lot of people going in and out, right? On a one hour service church. We got three hours, not many people want to come through, so we don't need a big door. A small door. Not just service time, but what we teach. Repentance, right? Uh, uh, ways of God, what it means to follow His commandments so that you can be blessed, whether it's the commandments of God, Ten Commandments, like the, Sabbath, uh, like the Fourth Commandment of, of keeping Sundays holy, whether it's teaching tithes and offering, which is a commandment of God and that you do need to do, which is going after your sin. If you're hiding your sin, and God shows me, and I got to go after you. <clears throat> Not many people want to be exposed, so they're like, I don't want to come here because the door is too narrow. I want to go to a big door where I can get lost in the crowd, and I'm not in anyone's radar, and I can do whatever I want to do. I'll just go to church and make a check. Check. I go on the church. Nobody bothers me. I'll go smoke my pot, and I'll pretend like it's good. That God is happy. And you can delude yourself. And realize that's a big door. Woo! Right? And, and you might think you're living an abundant life because you're high. Well, you're deluded. Oh, I see Oasis. It's an abundant life. Right? You're, you're deluded. Because you've allowed other spirits to enter, whether over the fence or through your door. It's not the true shepherd. And therefore, the promise that God has given us for his children, his bride, is not manifesting. Okay, you got to think about this, all right? You can say, I got God, but why isn't my life in God manifesting the life of God, the promises that he has given me to my family and, and spouse, why isn't it manifesting? What is the disconnect? Because there is a disconnect, right? 
It's just like your relationship with if a, a married couple. If you're not getting along and there's a problem, there's a disconnect. Something got to be resolved. You don't just keep going the same way and go, let's make it work. No, something's got to change. Someone has to change. Someone has to yield. Someone has to work harder. Someone has to take their role properly as a wife or a husband. You don't just, I want to do what I want to do. That's why people fight. I want to do what I want to do. You change. I don't want to change. You change. You're the problem. That kind of thought process, you're the problem. You look in the mirror, okay? When you tell someone to change, you practice on the mirror. You change. You change. You say it to yourself. You change. Okay, you're talking to yourself. Don't tell other people to change. God has given us all different colors of personality, right? Not to make your life miserable. It's to fine-tune you. Okay? How many marriages start out perfect? I mean, when you date, it looks perfect until you actually live with each other. Oh, my God! I didn't know what I was getting into. That's normal, though. You got to change. You don't expect your spouse to change. If you change and you know how to adjust to somebody else, now you're loving them. When you expect somebody else to adjust for you, you're, you're, you're ruling over them. Okay? You're ruling over them. And, and you, it's, it, you're kind of controlling them. It doesn't matter how bad they are on the outside. You have to adjust. And when you learn to adjust for somebody else. Now, I'm not saying. There is, a, there is context, of course, okay? But when you learn to adjust for somebody out of love. You will come to understand the ways of God. Most of us don't understand the ways of God because we're not really loving people. We just want them to change for us. That's the natural reaction, okay? Natural reaction to all of you. You, just, you need to change for me. That's the wrong reaction. All right, where are we at? Oh, put that up, okay. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only few, few find it. Okay, we'll stop there. Let's give the Lord a hand. Thank you, God.